Uh, welcome everyone to TRT Work Forum Digital Debates and to the session title mm -hmm. Between Securitization and Human Rights, What's Next for Refugees in Europe? I'm Shema from TRT World Resource Center. For today's discussion, I will be joined by two excellent guests, Parvati Nair, Professor of Hispanic Cultural and Migration Studies from Queen Mary University of London, and Admir Skodo, Senior Policy Analyst from Migration Policy Institute Europe. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight, we will discuss the future of refugees in Europe. We all know that the topic is a popular one and is already addressed in many aspects. But I think now, considering the recent developments in the field, such as the refugee flow from Ukraine, as well as the UK and Rwanda deal, a further discussion on the topic is needed. Europe is facing the biggest refugee flow since World War II. Around 3 million refugees from Ukraine have registered for protection schemes in Europe. In response, Europe has to have taken, so European countries have taken several measures, to, including taking measures regarding measures humanitarian needs. Moreover, the European Union has activated the Temporary Protection Directive for the first time. However, until recently, the European trend was to approach the issue of migration and refugees from a security perspective. The deal between the UK and Rwanda may as well be accepted as part of this trend. It is this stark contrast between Europe's approach to refugees from Ukraine and its prior practices that raise questions about the future of refugees from Europe. Are things changing in Europe for refugees? Is there a shift from prioritization of security to prioritization of human rights? This session, we will try to answer these questions. But before discussing about the future, let's start discussing what is happening now. I'd like to start with Parvati Nair. Parvati, do you think that Europe's approach to refugees from Ukraine is different than its approach to refugees from other countries? If so, how different it is and what might be the possible reasons for that? Thank you. Thank you, Shaima, for an excellent uh, question and focus on this very important topic. I think we are experiencing some <clears throat> extraordinarily interesting and important moments in terms of, you know, uh, refugee protection mechanisms that are possible. Um, and I think uh, it is indeed wonderful that uh, the EU has, you know, um, facilitated the opening of borders, the opening of homes. Um, for refugees from Ukraine. But as you rightly point out, that clearly oh, you know, lays open a lot of questions about why could this not have happened before? After all, in 2014-15, we saw a huge influx of refugees um, you know, from Syria um, going into countries like Turkey, etc., and then trying to get to Greece. But the securitization of borders made that a very, very challenging, risky and dangerous um, you know, endeavor. Um, I think there are there are you know different ways in which we can look at what is happening as we speak. Um, it could be that you know refugee protection um, has is discriminatory, and there are obvious reasons for which you know Ukrainian refugees might receive a kind of treatment that is not on offer to refugees from other parts of the world. But I think the other, the other flip side of that is the very heartening and um, positive um, idea or thought that actually action is possible, policies can be changed, and indeed there could be some landmark events around ref refugee protection that are happening at the moment, such as the temporary protection drive, which allows Ukrainians, you know, to have certain rights and to have a certain degree of well-being and care when they are in this extremely difficult situation that they are facing. Um, there's also the question of dropping the Dublin rule of, uh, you know, country of first arrival. Um, and uh, so I think we are, you know, we've heard for many years, there have been many human rights activists and others who have been very concerned about the human rights, the dignity, the safety of people through, you know, in, in, in the context of the European, um, you know, border policies. And at the moment, we're seeing another possibility. And I think it's a very interesting space to consider and to take note of. Thank you. 
So regarding the reasons for this changing approach and also these positive developments, as you mentioned, uh, Admir, I, may I ask you, uh, how do you think Europe's policy interests shape the approach from refugees from Ukraine? In other words, how does the fact that the reason for the refugee flow, flow is the invasion of Russia affect this approach? Okay, uh, first I want to just say thank you so much, Shema, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, I'll try to answer that question um, uh, as, as briefly as I can. Um, I think that Europe really has Russia or the Russian invasion to thank for its surprisingly surprisingly common approach when it comes to Ukrainian refugees. Um, and there are you know, several reasons for this, I think. Uh, one is that Russia is seen as a clear aggressor against a, a European country. And what we're seeing is that you know, everyday Europeans uh, and politicians alike are seeing uh, an imminent threat to, uh, uh, to the security of Europe through the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They also see, obviously, a massive humanitarian catastrophe in, in the European neighborhood, i.e. their neighborhood, right? So this has generated a lot of sympathy, uh, a lot of public support, a lot of political will that we otherwise don't see uh, in, when we see um, things like this play out in, in other parts of the world, right? And all this has translated into concerted action, right? And one interesting thing to note here, I think, is that so even countries that you know, actually still maintain business and diplomatic ties to Euro European countries that still maintain business and diplomatic ties to Russia and that have been strongly anti-immigrant uh, uh, in the past, even these countries have opened their door to, to Ukrainians and, and condemned the invasion, right? Uh, obviously, Hungary is the case in point here, right? Uh, Hungary is uh, very much dependent on uh, Russian um, gas and it, it, it has a deep, deep, uh, receive the uh, exemption from the EU to continue importing gas, but nonetheless still is willing to, to speak in pretty strong terms about the invasion and, and welcome uh, Ukrainian refugees. So what I want to say is this, what I want to say with this is, is very simple, actually. As a result of all this, countries in Europe with, with, with otherwise radically, really radically different migration policies have come together and, and have been able to act in unison as never before. Okay, so we say that the politics is important. Then also, the, I want to ask the question of the recent deal between Rwanda and UK then to you, Admir. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain us about uh, a bit about this deal? And then can you explain us as well the Europe's externalization of migration efforts in general? Sure, um, that's, a, that, that's a very good question. Um, so the deal itself, I think, is 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 um, actually maybe I'll start with with the externalization efforts in general, right? Um, and what I you know what I can say here is that um, maybe you know I want to say a few words about the Ukrainian response in relation to these because I think the Ukrainian response uh, is 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 really an, an exception to to uh, the, uh, development we've seen over the last decades, um, an exception to as you as you rightly point out the externalization measures, right? Um, so, but if this is the exception, then what is the norm? That is the question. And here we come to external, externalization. Um, so basically the norm in Europe, I think in the last decades has been to create a more restrictive and deterring in, in environment for, for asylum seekers. Of course, this environment looks very different from country to country, but I think pretty much all European countries nowadays share the ambition to limit the number of asylum seekers who, who seek to arrive to Europe in the first place, right? And these, this includes the various, uh, what we call externalization measures, um, which uh, all kind of try to, um, to, to um, well, there's different ways to do this, but, you know, basically um, have asylum seekers uh, apply not on the territory of, of a member state of the European Union, for example, but do it in some other country. Um, so there are many ex of examples of this. One is the uh, EU-Turkey deal of 2016. Um, where uh, Turkey basically stopped migrants from crossing over to Greece in exchange for, I think, something like 6 billion euros and visa-free entry to the EU. There was the deal that Italy made with Libya, the Libyan Coast Guard, to be more specific, where uh, the Libyan Coast Guard intercepted uh, boats carrying migrants trying to reach Italian shores and then took them back to Libyan detention centers. And, of course, we've seen a lot of horrible stories when that happens, even, even which is really remarkable. And, in this day and age, we've seen instances of what's, 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 what can be likened only to slavery in these, condi in these conditions. Um, of course, there's the illegal pushbacks um, that, that have been fairly rampant across the union. And you know, the most recent result of that is that the, the head of the 
Italian, uh, sorry, the, the EU uh, border agency Frontex, Fabrice Leggeri resigned recently, um, as you know, he was exposed as having promoted systemic pushbacks. Uh, and more generally, you know, uh, an externalization effort can take also different forms. And, and a, a more general type is, um, is that European countries and, of course, EU institutions have sought to use development aid to try to tackle uh, poverty in sending countries so as to kind of uh, address the root causes of migration so that, so that people don't, don't uh, attempt to come in the first place, right? So when we talk about the UK-Rwanda deal, I think we're definitely talking about the continuation of these uh, decades of externalization policies. Uh, but this deal is a little different and uh, it's different in that it's, I think, more radical than the others, right? It's, and it's more radical because what it proposes is to externalize the whole asylum procedure to, a, to enough, another country, Rwanda, right? So that would, that would mean that even if the person um, is granted asylum, that person would then simply stay in Rwanda and be integrated there. And that, that's, that is, I think, quite, quite different than the other externalization procedures. Thank you. Then what I understand is like the general approach of Europe is more securitization based. And we are recently facing a really radical deal, which uh, makes the people who applied for the asylum process to stay in Rwanda if they are granted with asylum. And then we have these positive developments, which are really uh, promising, but we don't know if they will create a president or not. Uh, I want to talk about numbers and I want to ask a question to you, Parvati, uh, because the UN Refugee Agency recently published a report and the report states that a record 89.3 million people are for forcibly displaced worldwide and 83 of the world's refugees are hosted in low and middle income countries. This is also relevant to what we said that like uh, addressing the root causes, etc. So how do you think the si situation is serious and what are the likely consequences of such high numbers as well as lack of responsibility sharing? Thank you. I think that's a very, very good, uh, you know, very important uh, question because of course, there are mounting numbers of refugees in the world and many of them, the vast, you know, majority of them are not in you know the more advanced countries contrary to the kind of press uh, the 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 impression one gets from reading the media uh, if we look at east africa for example or we look at bangladesh for example you know these are all or, or turkey for example you know these are all countries that are hosting extremely large numbers of refugees i think the the, the great breakdown if you like in in supportive and um, and uh, you know people centered approaches to refugee governance um the, the great dangers in this breakdown is are are very apparent if you know if we look across the world we see a proliferation of refugee camps and East Africa is a case in point, of course, you know, where you have these enormous camps. Jordan has the Zatari camp, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we see Lebanon, et cetera. We see, uh, you know, camps where literally, and I think, you know, in general, there is a sort of understanding that on average, when a refugee is properly resettled, somebody has had to give up their life. They've had to cross borders and go somewhere to seek a new life, make a new life. It can often take you know, up to 20 years, literally one generation, in order to properly integrate as a citizen and actually become part of the host society. That is in under good conditions. So, you know, just imagine a world where we have generations of children being born in camps as refugees. And we have the situation of multiple generational families of refugees who are living encamped lives constantly in limbo because of a breakdown of international cooperation, a breakdown in actual sources, uh, ref refugee, you know, support, refugee governance and proper refugee management. This is the status quo today. And this status quo is set to get much worse and probably even sooner than we actually could ever be prepared for. And that is because one of the biggest dangers that is facing us globally is 
climate, environmental crisis and climate change. And we're already seeing a situ situation, for example, you know, just yesterday in the press, we read about Niger, a country where a large number of children are malnourished. Now, Africa has a very large youth population, and it will be precisely from these countries which have large youth populations that people will be moving to seek a better life elsewhere because they have no choice. We cannot also sit in complacency in Europe or in the Western world or in you know, the developed countries or more advanced countries thinking this is not going to be us because the refugee is not somebody else. You know, the refugee could be you and me. And that is a matter of time in terms of climate change if we do not act. So I think it is extremely important to have proper refugee governance proper conversations of responsibility around, you know, um, support for refugees and refugee and, and the implementation of commitments to refugee law. They're absolutely vital for all of us in terms of our futures. Thank you so much. Uh, Admir, like following from there, actually, uh, I want to ask you a question about the role of international organizations, because Parvati mentioned the refugee governance, for example, or implementing the refugee laws. How important do you think the role of law and international organizations in determining refugee policies, especially Europe's refugee policies? And what effect are they likely to have on shaping Europe's uh, future policies? Very good question. Not, not, not an easy question. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, my first answer, answer is, is fairly straightforward. I think they're very important. Um, uh, look, refugee protection involves a lot of layers and a lot of actors. Parvati mentioned, I think, the importance just now of a kind of multi-stakeholder governance for the proper implementation and proper safeguarding of rights. Um, and I, I think that's great. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I think refugee policy tends to be best when all stakeholders are involved, when all stakeholders are uh, uh, invited to the table. Um, for their UK or Rwanda deal, I don't know if they were honestly, so which might explain some of the some of the uh, some of the outcomes there. But um, I think you know, if we talk specifically about international organizations like uh, the UNHCR, uh, obviously what they bring to the table is they can they can they can explain the international norms that governments abide by and have agreed to abide by uh, by law, right? They can also explain the practical challenges that they face on the ground. Uh, as can a numerous a host of other uh, um, organizations, right? And that, I, th I, I would say that is invaluable information for any kind of decision making regarding offering protection in this in a manageable way, but it all, which also ensures the human dignity of people. Um, and of course, I would also like to mention that um, there's the, the, the importance of independent courts, international courts is extremely important. As we saw with the UK-Rwanda deal, the European Court of Human Rights um, issued an injunction which stopped the deportation of the first batch of people that were supposed to be deported to Rwanda. Uh, and the you know, UK has signed um, uh, signed on to this court and it, is a, it abides by its rules. However, we've seen overtures by, by the UK government that um, it's not unsure whether it's gonna continue being part of these courts. And I think it's it would be very important uh, to, to have these courts in place, obviously. Um, now to the question of how likely they'll, they'll have uh, an impact, these international organizations, I. Um, that that is, I think, much more much more un uncertain. I think, uh, especially given that we live in a world now when when um, I think sovereign or national interests are very very high on the agenda, and I think it's getting you know it's, it's increasingly harder for these types of organizations to get a place at the table. But uh, certainly, I think they they should have a place at the table. Thank you. Uh, then moving from there, Parvati, I want to ask you a question uh, because we talked about uh, refugee global governance and also we talked about the UK Rwanda deal and the UK government said that this deal is good for tackling human, human smuggling and trafficking and addressing the root causes of migration. Uh, can you tell us what you think, how necessary is this deal or like this kind of efforts? for addressing the root causes of migration? And do you think they will work? Or also, like, can you address this question more of a kind of high-income, low-income countries' relation and cultural backgrounds as well? Thank you. Thank you, Seema. Um, I think my view is that it is the question is not so much is, is this kind of effort necessary, but really, um, is this really a sincere effort? 
because I would not say that outsourcing the management of refugees to another country is does anything really to tackle the question of um, the underground business in human mobility. Nobody goes to smugglers because they want to. It's not like we're shopping around and we could get a visa maybe through the consulate, but no, let's go through the smuggler. This is not the situation at all in the world. There is, um, you know, there, there is immigration policy and border policy at work here that is actually facilitating, if you like, the, uh, the existence of this underground smuggling routes. And yes, uh, these are criminal businesses. They are un, you know, unlawful, they are risky, they are dangerous, they, they are exploitative. We all know what you know, the dangers and risks are, but these are usually um, ways in which people who do not have other options find ways of moving from where they are to a better place. So the UK Rwanda deal, in my view, is an absolute flop, not only a flop, but it is, it is a travesty to say that it, uh, it addresses this issue. It does not. In fact, in fact, Israel already did a deal with Rwanda, I think in 2014, and actually um, sent over uh, Eritreans and people from the Horn of Africa to Rwanda for their, for their papers to be processed there. So this deal is in fact modeled on the Israel-Rwanda deal. And it is generally acknowledged that what happened was those people actually escaped from the camps and once again went into, you know, via the illicit routes, tried to make their ways towards Europe. Again, through extremely risky ventures, crossing the Mediterranean, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, in fact, this does not, this is not a deal that is going to address it at all. On the contrary, it probably makes the situation, you know, worse, more likely. Um, why do these things happen? Why does Europe have its border policies? Why is Frontex at work? Why does the UK have this border policy? You know, why does this happen? There are many reasons. And of course, some of them are historical and others are geopolitical. And indeed, in the case of, you know, why is Ukraine not you know, why are Ukrainians not in this situation is probably to do with the geopolitical, you know, location of, of Ukraine, both geographically and also in terms of strategy for Europe and, and other parts of the world. Um, and there are other parts where, um, you know, these, these same dynamics are not at work. And so that, you know, is, is a key issue, if you like, in terms of determining who gets access and entry and who doesn't. Um, there's also the skill level. So, you know, there are there are people who are coming in. So the questions of race, the questions of religion, the questions of skill level, which may not be explicitly, you know, on the table when it comes to these decisions. But if we look at who the UK selected in order to go, send off to Rwanda, they were mainly people from, you know, with, you know, uh, of Afghan, Iraqi, Iranian, uh, Syrian origins. So, you know, the question then asks is, what is the selection process? What is the logic here? Then there is a question comes to my mind about the role of integration, actually, because we talked about race and religion. And then we talked about also this deal doesn't help to address the root causes or like stop at least trafficking or smuggling. Can we say that policies towards integration or integrating these people into labor markets would be more helpful or would it be realistic to realize this in the near future? I'm asking this question to you, Parvati, because you mentioned that uh, the approach towards refugees from Ukraine actually is a promising approach, which I also agree uh, because, for example, European Commission endorsed integrating refugees into labor markets. So do you think this is a good start for integrating refugees, looking for integration of refugees in Europe? I think Europe needs its workers. It needs workers. It, Europe has an aging population. Um, there are many industries that actually, you know, require hands on deck. Uh, the care industry, hospitality, you know, uh, so, so many other um, public facing jobs have been done across European societies for a long time now by people who are, you know, uh, from other countries. 
And here I do not make a very clear distinction between refugees and immigrants because many, many immigrants to Europe are people from very fractured societies or post-conflict societies or economically broken societies. And often there is a combination, a very, very difficult combination of all these factors, you know, which put people, which, which place individuals and people in very, very vulnerable situations. And a lot of these people come and make enormous contributions. And, and uh, these contributions are only going to be needed more. The pandemic was a clear, clear, um, you know, case in point. Uh, here in the UK, the NHS desperately needed its workers, you know, and we had just gone through Brexit and a lot of Europeans had actually left this country. So there is a need. There is a need. There is definitely a need. And yes, work is a wonderful way of integrating into society and giving back and contributing and enriching. And I come from a city very proudly here in London where we have over 300 languages spoken every day. And the wonderful wealth and diversity of the city, you know, and its buzz, its vibe is really because of every single one of these people from every corner of the earth. And I think that is not valued enough. Yes, I agree. Uh, thank you. Uh, Admir, actually, I want to ask you the similar question because I think the issue of integration and then integrating people into labor markets or, for example, making them apply for the alternative routes such as, like, not as refugees, but as, I don't know, immigrants mm -hmm. is important. So do you think that Europe's policies are leaning towards this or do you think it, since it's a more complex issue, Europe is not considering it well or is it difficult to inter like integrate refugees actually? That's, that's, that's uh, I think, a, a really excellent quest question, Shema. Uh, the answer is uh, the European Union certainly is uh, exploring uh, these options. And they're called, they have various names. Uh, one of them is complementary pathways, complementary pathways to uh, seeking asylum or being resettled as a refugee. And these complementary pathways can be uh, labor pathways, obviously, that's the big one. Others can be educational pathways. Um, uh, yet another type of pathway is a humanitarian, they call humanitarian corridors, which is reserved for very, very, very high, high, highly vulnerable people, right? But labor pathways obviously is very high on the agenda because as Parvati mentioned, there is a huge labor shortages that Europe is trying to fill. Um, and uh, I think this is definitely a, a path that, it's, uh, that it wants to explore and, and, and is exploring. Um, and, and what it means basically is that uh, it, 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 it wants people that have been recognized as refugees to come in uh, but through through labor visas, for example, or or or, or study visas, or, or, or and so on, there are uh, I think currently uh, a number of operational challenges. Uh, but there is a clear commitment. Um, I'd say pretty much every uh, European state to to uh, scale this up, right? Um, and I think that's something that's only going to grow in the future. And I think it is a promising trend uh, that 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 um, that could really really help a lot of people and at the same time helping Europe fill its labor needs. Yeah. So maybe also we can say that it will be a long term solution instead of expecting people to go back to their countries if the problems there are solved. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, you know, as you know, sorry, not to, not to interrupt. But yes, I mean, when you commit to getting someone through a, a labor pathway or educational pathway, I mean, th those are two fundamental aspects of integration, right? So you're kind of baking integration in from day one. And usually, you know, in these discussions in the European Union about how to develop uh, programs, there's a lot of focus on how do we uh, add additional training? How do we add language course training? How do we do cultural training so that people feel at home, right? How do we actually make, get them to feel at home in the community to which they uh, are resettling, right? Um, I, I do think also there is a shift there in rethinking about integration as starting from day one, it really from no matter what, what status you're in. Uh, I think the, the data shows that the benefits far outweigh the risks of, of doing that. Um, so yes, I think it's absolutely something on the on the agenda and and uh, and and potentially can can really make a, make a difference in the, in the future. And can I just add to that, you know, just to say, I think that's fantastic what Admiral is saying, and it's it's absolutely true. Uh, but you know, there, I think one of the sort of key links there is the is the dialogue between state authorities and local authorities, and there are some wonderful examples across Europe of you know integration uh, efforts by local authorities and do you think like with the refugee flow from ukraine it is improving 
because I believe there are lots of works done with the local, but thanks to local authorities. To Parvati. That's sorry. Or Parvati. <laughs> from here, Parvati. I'm First sorry, Parvati. I'm sorry. I'm I, didn't sorry. Hear your, I didn't hear your question. What was it? So I'm asking, you mentioned the uh, cooperation between local authorities and governments. Do you think this situation is improving uh, with the refugee flow, flow from Ukraine? Because local authorities had to do a lot of things to deal with the mass influx. Yes. I, I think, you know, it is very tragic that the Ukrainian people have been displaced in this way. But I think there are some very important lessons that are being learned as we are as we speak, uh, because uh, other ways are possible and this is being proven. And once that precedent is there in place, then the, 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 the rationale to extend this more widely to people from other parts of the world is that much stronger. Yeah, because we have good examples that have been, you know, actioned, and that's that's uh, fundamental, of course. Yes, it's very hopeful. Yeah, thank you, Admir. Do you have anything to say on that? Or uh, yeah, a few things. No, I mean, because I, I, I definitely think this is such an important avenue, future avenue, and there's so many lessons, as Parvati has mentioned, that are that are being formed. Uh, the, the curriculum, let's say, is being formed now. Uh, it remains to be seen whether it will be taught <laughs> later on. But um, uh, certainly, I think uh, another pathway called community sponsorship has been ext extremely important, I think, here, where, where basically private citizens commit to hosting refugees. I mean, they did this in 2015-16, which just also shows the importance of that response and its positive impact. A lot of the same networks have been triggered in 2022 to help people. Uh, uh, and that's also something that's being explored um, at the EU level. Um, and, and, you know, I do want to mention that, you know, in relation to 2015-16, there are some interesting and, you know, you don't often hear in at least in, in, in political circles, uh, you, know, you don't hear 2015-16 as something very positive, right? It's like often you hear we're not going back to 15-16. But there are, there are interesting cases like Finland, for example, where... Uh, Finland also had the, the largest number of asylum seekers arrive in 2015-16. I mean, there was it was really a big increase for them, something like 20, 30,000, which is which is a, with a lot, right? Because they've had, I think, maybe hundreds, thousands at most. Um, so what happened is, uh, again, the, the local uh, municipalities to, shouldered, uh, shouldered a lot of the burden, took them in, and then discovered, oh, we have this resettlement program. <laughs> Up until 2015-16, the, the national quota, you know, set by the national government of how many refugees are supposed to be taken in, um, they could never fill that quota until 2015-16. But the, you know, the enthusiasm and willingness of, of local governments after 2015-16 has meant that since then, there's, there's actually more demand, <laughs> if I can use those terms, for refugees than there are quota places. And the government, the Finnish government, has actually been increasing the number of quotas, right? So that's something that I think we easily overlook from, from you know, the similarities to the, to the, to the last crisis. And, and again, just underscores the importance of the local level and what the local level can, can do to generate political interest to actually welcome more people. I, I, and I think that it's what, what is very interesting is, the, is this idea that actually you don't have to be an activist to help. You, you are doing a social act by offering help when you can. So I think just removing the whole refugee issue from this realm of activism where it has to go against the predominant grain and actually seeing it as part of being a good citizen, you know, of your city, of your country and of your region. Th these are very important shifts that are happening. Then there comes to my mind about the question about the perception. Uh, Parvati, maybe I can start asking you a question about that. Because we said that then the issue is not about activism, but more about local work doing something good. Uh, how do you think the recent developments uh, affected people's perception as well as government's perception towards refugee flows in Europe? In well, I think that um, uh, you know the unfortunate situation for Ukrainians has led to a much um, deeper and wider awareness of, you know, of refugee realities. Um, also, I think the realization that you don't have to come from another continent to be a refugee, you know, or from overseas, literally, in that sense, you know, you could be the neighbor next door. And if it's the neighbor next door, what's going to stop, you know, it from coming closer into the home, if you like, and make the home uh, a, a place of, uh, you know, exit rather than, than, than uh, dwelling. 
So I think uh, the the awareness level has has greatly you know uh, expanded and deepened. I think the um, humanization or humanizing of refugees as as a real reality that is a very difficult and you know sometimes impossible one for people to face. These are all issues that these are all things that are happening. Um, but you know, I think it, there is still work to be done, and the media plays a very, very important role, if you like, in educating the public on these realities. Yes, and Admir, can I ask you the same question about perception, and maybe like how public and media's perception and reflection on the issue affects Europe's politics? Oh no, I mean it's yeah. I think Parvati pretty much uh, summed it up. The, I, but you know, again, for me, it just. I, I do just want to re-emphasize what, what what she said, which is the the the, the, the importance of, of of media and public perceptions in 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 shaping public sentiment, and then public sentiment in turn shaping political action, right? Because with two thousand with 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 twenty twenty two, despite the fact that we have what 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 is it four million people, we're st we're we're not seeing words like chaos and and uh, even even the word crisis is really not used that much. Um, uh, th there is really, uh, I think, uh, a, a strong effort made by various groups to, to instill a sense of trust that, you know, this is under control, this is manageable. And I think clearly it shows that it is possible to, to kind of use this language, you know, for other types of situations. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I certainly think that's, 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 that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Admir, I have a question for you again. Uh, and now I want to look at the future. And I want to ask you, like, do you think this externalization efforts will prevail or like good pr examples of temporary protection directive, etc., will take a president in Europe's politics? Okay, that's a, that's a good, again, very good question. <laughs> so, um, okay, let me start with the UK Rwanda deal. I think the, I think it's unlikely that the, the UK Rwanda deal specifically Will become a new externalization norm in the in the near future, and I think there are several several reasons for that. Um, okay, one reason is that really in this form, it's only the UK and Denmark that have considered this idea, um, and Denmark uh, is one of the few countries left in the EU that's allowed to opt out of its immigration policies. Right, the UK when it was part of the EU was also allowed to opt out of migration policies, which it did. Right. Um, the rest of the EU uh, countries and the EU uh, Commission itself has flouted the idea of externalization. In 2018, there was the idea of creating these control centers, I don't know if you remember, and these embarkation centers, but that fell pretty flat. Um, and uh, since then, the, e the, the, the EU and other EU European countries are not considering this idea, right? I think that's one reason. Another reason for this deal is that Rwanda, I mean, if you think about it, it's only a memorandum of, of understanding. What that means is it's not a legal binding document, right? No, no party is obliged to do anything and there won't be any recourse to justice or any court if something someone does anything, right? So it's a pretty weak document. Um, and it, even within this weak document, Rwanda has the power to not accept any asylum seeker. It doesn't want to accept, okay? Um, uh, so, so yeah, <laughs> it just doesn't make it very effective. Um, also, Rwanda, another reason, right, is that Rwanda is, I think, an outlier in, in among Af African countries. Certainly, I think most other African countries, uh, uh, as far as I know, are not willing to, to, to do these kinds of deals, right? So the question is, if other European countries want to continue doing this, are they all going to send their refugees to, to Rwanda? That's, again, that doesn't seem likely. Um, and, you know, there's uh, already these legal challenges that we saw that might actually sink, <laughs> sink this boat until it, until it, uh, even before it takes off. And of course, something another important thing that I think why it won't really uh, be a norm is that I think Parvati, you mentioned this before, but you know I just want to add to this. We know from the American experience and Australian experiences of offshoring and having these kind of deterrence policy that they don't work. They don't work from deterring people. People simply, it, it don't, but they, what they mainly do is to kind of redirect them along even more dangerous routes and um, lead them into the arms of smugglers, right? Which is the, the counter effect, at least the explicit counter effect. Of what the intended policy is. Finally, I think it really won't be the norm because if you look at the political support for the UK-Rwanda deal, um, it doesn't seem to have that much political support. Uh, even, even in Boris Johnson's conservative government, there are pretty high up figures that have been pretty uh, uh, strong about condemning, condemning it as, as inhuman, right? 
So I think this specific form, I, I, I just don't see it as being likely to, 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 to become a norm. However, other forms of externalization, uh, pushbacks, uh, other kinds of deals like Spain-Morocco deal, the EU-Turkey deal, uh, the closure of border, temporary or more permanent, um, pr processing asylum claims at external borders altogether, these kinds of measures, I think, will be more more prevalent. And of course, as as, as they do, I think we, we might we might see continue seeing more unnecessary human suffering and and frankly, the the further hollowing out of the of the right right to asylum. Okay, okay. So we say that like externalization efforts in Europe will continue, not in the not in the form similar to the UK Rwanda deal, but in different forms, which were actually going on for a while. It certainly appears that way at the moment. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And Parvati, again, looking at the future, uh, you mentioned climate change, actually. I wasn't thinking of asking a question you, about you this, but like it's interesting and it's becoming more and more important. So how do you think the issue of climate change will affect Europe's future policies regarding refugees? Well, I think what I would say in response to that, Shema, is very much linked to what Admir has just uh, pointed out, which is that there are many processes at play around uh, the externalization of borders. So border policy is not just hardening and becoming in a heavily securitized for Europe, but also geographically expanding so that we have Frontex working with, uh, you know, IOM in Niger to, for example, process, you know, uh, migration, um, you know, the papers of potential migrants, etc., and consider the cases there, so that people are actually being blocked from being physically where they would like to be, you know, when when uh, their their cases are being considered and that their um, documentation is under scrutiny. So um, I think these these efforts, you know, the question that comes to mind is why do these countries from the you know developing parts of the world actually engage in these links with Europe. And it is clearly one to do with your question, earlier question around unequal, you know, inequalities in the world and economic and political inequalities. And obviously, I think what we what we are seeing is a proliferation of this kind of border management uh, at play and uh, being enacted on, uh, you know, in, in on the soil, if you like, of countries from which people are trying to leave. And so, uh, there are economic deals that are tied to these practices, and these are the reasons why these, um, you know, poorer economies engage in, in uh, you know, with, with the richer parts of the world in these deals. Um, these are not deals done with a people-centered approach, really. So um, it is not going to stop the flow because, like I said, I think the number of climate refugees is going to, to mount. Uh, global inequalities are are growing. So I think, as such, uh, you, and and the global population is is expanding. So when you have the situation, you're going to find that human mobility, the flows, are going to be there, and they're going to push against these border policies. But these border policies uh, and practices are also going to try and encircle and contain these flows. So there is going to be that kind of dynamic, and it's quite a a violent one, actually. But it is intrinsically tied, if you like, to questions of economics, politics, and regional and, and global dynamics. It's, it's important, I think, when we look at refugee uh, practices, refugee management practices, to really situate that within the larger you know, context of global politics, global political hegemonies, and you know, ongoing interests that are regional uh, and, and perhaps even, even wider than regional. Thank you, thank you. You mentioned a lot of things. Actually, <laughs> we talked a lot. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you to kind of wrap up and start with Admir. Uh, so can you portray us the future of landscape for refugees in Europe, like considering all the things we talked? Certainly, I'm just gonna get my crystal ball. <laughs> and can... No, I'm just, I'm just kidding, I'm <laughs> kidding. No, but it is, it, it is, it is obviously difficult to, to to talk about the future, as everyone knows. Um, I do think, though, there, there are trends we're seeing. Um, I, what I would like to do by, by, by way of summary is um, to uh, reflect a little bit uh, on the current landscape and where it's going. So I think within the current landscape, 
what I suggest is there are two different paths that Europe can take. Okay, so if the uh, European response to Ukraine is indeed a unique case, and it, and it might be, right? Then I think uh, we'll continue. It'll be it'll continue being very difficult for for asylum seekers to come to Europe. Certainly, in large numbers. Now, external borders will get stronger, um, and currently we're seeing that trend. We're seeing in the light, latest EU budget, for example, uh, 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 a significant increase in funding for the for Frontex and border control measures, but not as much for into integration measures and reception measures. What right? Europe may still accept smaller numbers of pre-selected refugees, which will of course uh, risk opening up. Uh, critiques of um, cherry picking and and not really fully addressing the needs of uh, the millions of people that that tens of millions at, at this point I think it might be actually a hundred I saw I think today I saw that it might be a hundred million that we're seeing that that are need in need of protection All right so but that's one path there is another p- possible path I think we should at least consider the scenario that the response to Ukraine isn't a one off right. And there are some signals there. I mean, everyone thought that the temporary protection directive was pretty much dead. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and it came to life precisely in the moment when everyone th- thought it was dead, right? Uh, uh, so, and I think, again, this directive is, 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 is great. And I think it can certainly be used to, to, to manage millions of refugees, uh, the arrival of millions of refugees effectively. The question is, will there be, uh, will there be political will to use it again, right? Um, I don't think, Parvati has mentioned this, I don't think we'll stop seeing forced displacement anytime soon. Climate refugee crises are just around the corner. They're already uh, unfolding in various parts of the world. Although there are conversations on how to address these that are going on, I think they're still very, very way, vague and abstract. And I think they need to get a little more concrete. Um, you know, and I just end with, with a final somewhat provocative question, which is, uh, you know, how, how, long can, how long can Europe and, you know, the rest of the world, really, how long can the world affords to kick this looming humanitarian catastrophe down the road? <laughs> it's a good question to ask. And Parvati, uh, as I told you, you mentioned about a lot about really good points and focusing on the issue from a wider perspective. And also we have the question from Admir actually. So why can you also portray us the future of refugees in Europe? I, I wish I could. I wish I could, and I wish I could make it look good. Um, I, I totally agree with Admir. You know, I think he has touched on a lot of very key points there. I think there is a quest. There is a glimmer of hope in that there is a, di- a different possibility is being enacted towards Ukrainians. Uh, I think the big que- there are a couple of big questions in my head, and really, I don't have the answers. But I do have the questions, if you like. And one of them is really also, you know, one of them is uh, in terms of good practices, in terms of a people-centered approach, a caring approach, a responsible approach. Can we can we learn from this idea that the Ukrainians are Mm -hmm. Europe's neighbors? And can we think of the global, you know, the world's citizens as our neighbors? Uh, That's one question. I think it is really about what we consider ours as opposed to theirs. So really, it is about that fundamental value system, if you like. Um, And it's it's about who who we are responsible for. Um, and, And the second one is to really understand that the refugee situation and the migrant situation, um, nobody really wants to leave home unless they are really forced to for all kinds of reasons. Um, And in this context, perhaps one of the biggest areas to address rapidly, urgently, and in a concerted way is the question of climate change. This is fundamental because without that, it is a question of time really and not much time that too before all of us become refugees of one sort and there is nowhere to go to. So this is, a, I think, a very important consideration. The question is, will Europe bear that in mind soon enough? Thank you. So there we have left lots of questions, more than answers, I think, but this is normal. <laughs> And I hope that we will take into consideration the good parts, like human based, a human-based approach, and then taking care of people, and then also integration, as well as cooperating with local authorities. Thank you both for joining me for tonight's discussions. I know there are lots of things to talk more, but we have limited time. But I was so happy to see you here and then talk about this issue. Uh, Thank you. And thank you for our audience. Thank you.